Welcome to the Entrepreneur Next Door, and it's my pleasure to welcome Tess Newman, all the way from Finland. Welcome, Tess. Thank you for doing this. Uh, in about a minute or so, tell us who you are. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. So my name is Tess Newman. I'm a Ugandan best in Finland. I'm a career strategist. I help individuals get hired or promoted in less than 90 days, and I'm an investor. That's what okay. I do. <laughs> Short and sweet. All right. So now we go dig in and we start to peel the Tess onion slowly, <laughs> but surely. Um, mm -hmm. So Tess, uh, people can't see you, although though it will be on my, the YouTube version of the podcast will be, will be there, but uh, I can see you and with your accent, uh, it's not a Finnish accent. So, so tell me where, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Uganda, in a city called Kampala, which is the capital of Uganda. Mm -hmm. And when I graduated, I went straight to Dubai uh, with my then boyfriend. <laughs> so we moved to Dubai because they got a permanent job. He was working in Nokia. So I started my career there. I graduated the same month I graduated, I moved to uh, Dubai. So we lived in Dubai for eight years and then moved to Finland because he's Finnish and my kids are Finnish. Oh, wow. Okay. You gave me way more than I expected, which is great. Um, so, so yeah. So Finland gave us Nokia, which is, I remember my first Nokia phone, the clamshell. Clearly there's never been anything like it uh, to this day. The clamshell Nokia cell phone mobile was amazing. I didn't, I didn't know that one. <laughs> Well, ask him. Uh, actually, I just heard a, a podcast interview with uh, the chief marketing officer of Nokia. Um, mm -hmm. Very interesting guy. But anyway, the clamshell phone was indestructible, literally. You could throw it against the wall. Nothing would happen to it. Um, and Nokia has some great, great products. So your boyfriend drags you to Dubai, yes. which is a completely different world than than finland um, and and of course the first thing that comes to my mind is um how did what did it feel like to be a woman in dubai it felt great <laughs> for starters <laughs> okay i i at the time i was there uh, there weren't uh, very very many uh, africans in uh, the corporate world so it, was, it felt a bit lonely, but then with time, people started to, you know, to, to know about Dubai and moving, people started to mm -hmm. move there and started to have you know, real jobs other than you know, the, the blue collar jobs. So moving from Uganda to Dubai, for me, it was, it was a, a challenge because I grew up in Uganda with my parents and then moving away from your parents, um, living with somebody you've not lived with, and then you're starting a new life. You are, you're not oriented about what's going to happen, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So you go to a country, you have these dreams, you're like, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this kind of job. And then you start to apply for jobs. And guess what? The only thing you get are rejections. <laughs> so you can imagine. So that's how I started my journey in, um, in Dubai. And yeah, also the time I moved to Dubai, I remember <laughs> the many girls used to come to, to leave Uganda to Dubai to do prostitution. So it was really difficult to, to exit at the airport. They, they required so many things. And I was like, I'm just going to see my boyfriend. I'm just moving to Dubai. They're like, no, you have to bring this. And there were the, a list of requirements. And looking back right now, I was like, ah, Jesus, this is, it was really too much. But today it's, it's a bit different hmm. when, you're living, yeah, when you're living in Uganda to the Middle East. Yeah, I, I wasn't... I've never been to Dubai, but I wasn't aware that 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 what you said was there was such so much incoming prostitution that any single woman showing up was automatically tagged with okay, that's what she's here for. But when I said how was it to for you as a woman to be in Dubai, not from that perspective, but really from I mean the cultural restrictions that are placed on women where you have to dress a certain way you can't do this you can't do that in public does that affect affected you at all no it didn't um i'm not a muslim i'm a christian 
-hmm. And there is no law that says you should put on a buyer or cover you, yourself if you are not Muslim. It's not okay. there. That's a myth. People put on short things. Um, other than during Ramadan, when they are fasting, you shouldn't put on short things and go to the public and you go to public places. Uh, you shouldn't eat on the streets. It's actually illegal to eat on the streets. Even chewing gum, even just moving with a bottle of water that is not full. Mm. So that is not acceptable. But you can do anything you want. Live like a normal person. It's um, actually Dubai as compared to, now that I'm in Finland, as compared to Finland, you feel you want to be a woman in, in the UAE than you would want to be a woman in Europe. <laughs> so it's, it's more favorable for women there than it is in Europe. Hmm. Well, that's, that's good to hear. Um, yeah. So I want to go back to your childhood in Uganda when you were a teenager. And if I, if I ran into you somewhere and I said, Tess, what do you want to be when you grow up, when you were 15, 16? Did you, did you have an idea back then or you were just being a kid? I wanted to be, I wanted, first of all, I wanted to be a bank manager growing up and then at some point i switched to air hostess i so much wanted to travel so that to be to be in aviation but then i did i, I did psychology my bachelor's is in psychology so when i finished psychology it's like oh it's interesting i want to do to do something that is related to helping people so when i moved to dubai i was looking for a job as a, a admin manager first uh, then um yeah looking back i first of all wanted to be a bank manager <laughs> well <laughs> that's where the money is <laughs> we we're all yeah. thinking okay in the bank that's where the money is if you work in the bank then you're gonna really have all, you know all that money when you're a child you know but so, but you know it's it's not your money test you know <laughs> the money is there <laughs> well <laughs> as you grow older that's when you realize okay it's you know, it's, it's not your money, but when you're a child, you think everybody that works in the bank is rich. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, so by the way, yeah. I, I always, sometimes because I talk to entrepreneurs and marketing people, and sometimes we throw some terminology that not everyone might be uh, familiar with, but you use a term that I haven't heard before, and I want to translate it. You said, I want to be an air hostess, which in my, in our world, it's a flight attendant right you want yeah, it to be yeah okay yeah, got it yeah, just yeah. just i just want to make sure okay that's it so yeah um all right so we fast forward you get an undergrad in psychology like me so good uh i was obsessed with human brain to this day it hasn't left me i'm still intrigued by this thing that's inside our head uh yeah. you then go get an ms in psychology yeah and to top it off, since you seem to be really bored, you go get an MBA in management and leadership. Yeah. So, so you have two masters, one in psychology, one undergrad. Um, and then what was your first real job then? My first real job was admin manager. I worked in that position for three months and I got promoted to HR manager. Mm -hmm. Then I worked in that company for four years and moved because <clears throat> it was one day that authorities came and they were like, all right, the license for this company has been revoked for whatever reasons. And they gave us one month to move and look for another, uh, either you look for another job or you exit because in UAE, you have to be sponsored to stay in, in the country. On a residence mm -hmm. visa either the company is sponsoring you or your partner if you have a husband or wife so one of them has to rather whichever it is uh, it has to sponsor you so i left that company i was working as an hr manager i worked for four years then got another job as head of department for teacher recruitment so we were recruiting teachers for abu dhabi education council mm. i worked for that company for seven months but there were actually five months then two months were notice period then i left again you have a question yes i do so the <laughs> the, the, the your first job with were you an admin manager and promoted to hr mm -hmm. uh, not supposed to ask women how old they are but i'm gonna ask you anyway how old 
How old were you when you started that HR manager job? <laughs> I was in my 20s. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> I right. was in my 20s, yeah. All right. So, but, so there's a reason why I'm asking. So, uh, you know, how does a 20-year-old yeah. take a position to now oversee human resources in a company? I mean, you don't know anything. You're just a, you're 20, right? 20-something, yes. right? So when I got tired, when, at the time I got tired, this is what I told my boss, the owner of the company. I didn't have experience. I was right from school and he was really skeptical on hiring me. So I told him, whatever goals you have for this position, don't reduce even one just because I don't have experience. Set the same goals for me, give me 90 days. And if you're not happy, I will leave no questions asked. So he said, okay, um, I'm gonna think about it and all that. I said, what, whatever you need to think about, you have to think about it now because I'm not leaving this place without a job. <laughs> I'm not leaving this place without a job. So, I, so he talked to, to the partner and then they hired me. And they said, we hope we won't be disappointed. And of course, I didn't have experience. I didn't know anything, but I had to spend a lot. I, have, I had to put in more time to make sure that I met the goals. So after three months, when we sat down again, uh, my boss then said that, unfortunately, you don't have this position anymore. Now, in me, I was like, okay, now I'm gonna be fired. Then he said, now we're promoting you to HR manager because we have looked at, really evaluated what, you, what you've been doing and we feel you will shine more in HR. They didn't have an HR department, so I had to start from scratch. So there, there's something to be said about tenacity and grit and drive, which clearly you have. But then you still have to learn how to do the job. So how did yes. you figure it out? How did you figure it out? Research. I did a lot of reading. I, uh, whatever I read, I went to implement. And then I went on trainings. I need certifications. I have a, I'm, I'm certified. I'm an HR certified uh, professional, HR certified manager, HR certified consultant. <laughs> so I had to go and get all the training I needed and whatever I was learning, I was coming to implement. Yeah. So um, one of my questions was, how did you wind up in Finland? But you told me, so you, you, you met your boyfriend in Finland and then he got the job in in Dubai, so you you follow him, and then at some point you come back, right? You leave yeah. Dubai, and you go back to Finland. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, what is the what was your because you have a degree in psychology, two degrees, right? And then yeah. one in one in MBA in management leadership. Mm -hmm. Um. What was the attraction to HR, which is still what you do today? And we'll get to that in a little bit. But why HR? Uh, with your kind of training, you could do a bunch of other things. Um, I think it was because of the first, my first boss. When he pushed me into HR, I went deep into HR. And it's it's the... It's the department that I fell in love with within the entire organization. In my last company before I moved out of Dubai it was an engineering company. And I, again, it, it's, you know, it was funny that every company I joined, they didn't have an operational HR department. So I had to start from scratch. So with that particular company, I worked in all departments. I worked in design and estimation. I worked in operations, business development, procurement. But I always found, found myself more interested you know, in, in HR. So that is why I'm there. And in HR, I'm able to help people uh, achieve their full potential. You see, when someone's career is a mess, everything else will be a mess. And for me, I learned that from a personal experience. Okay, when so we went, now, so, sorry, so yeah. I, want, I want to stop you and I apologize. So, so no, let's, okay. let, let's unpack that, right? Um, <laughs> when somebody's career is a mess, your personal life is a mess, and you say it from personal experience. Yeah. What, what does that mean? 
tell tell me about the mess in your life that pushed you at some point to it, um i remember when we were in dubai um my husband he was no longer a boyfriend because in dubai you can't live together when you first of all you can't live together when you're not married so we had to get married at some point to live together with the kids mm -hmm. so whilst we were living together at some point nokia wanted to lay him off and he did tell me about it i didn't know so one day he comes to me to the bedroom and he says why are you not dying so i'm like sorry <laughs> why do you want me to die so he said i've tried to kill you three times today but you're not dying and i'm like what did i do so uh, then he got an opportunity he was referred to back to finland in the same company so i, I told him so why is it that you really wanted to kill me. Like, you seemed serious, so why, why was it that you wanted to kill me? Then he said, because my company wanted to lay me off, so I, I didn't know how I'm going to live with you and the kids, how were we going to survive? Um, I felt like I had failed as a husband. Hmm. So that got me thinking. And that is, at, at that point, that, that is when I started to sit down with my colleagues to understand if they're doing well in their you know, marriages or relationships. And then I realized that most of them were fighting because things weren't going well at work. Their career was a mess and then it extended to their families. Mm -hmm. Now, because of that, it's like, no, I, I can't move to any other, I can't move to any other department. If I'm in HR, I'm going to be able to help people get back on track if they've lost track and then their families are gonna be happy as well. But your husband said he wanted to kill you, not himself, because he was a failure, right? Yeah, I know, I know, because he thought he couldn't take care of me and the kid. That's what he. Okay, that's what that that's what he said. Okay. So yeah, and, and I, I I just imagine how many people were in the same situation because when bad things happen to us in life, in most cases we look for the nearest person to blame. Mm -hmm. other than ourselves we're always looking at who to point the finger to so at rather so i was the nearest person not even his boss but me <laughs> and the kids because his plan apparently was that he would kill me and the kids and then he would he would dump over the the building so <laughs> that was his plan <laughs> That, that that really sounds like a really bad movie. So we'll move on because obviously this has a happy ending and he got job back at Nokia and you were able to move to Finland. Uh, but I, I think, look, the, the point you're making is in its simplicity is very true. Uh, and the number one reason why relationships tend to fall apart and have and have issues is typically because of financial constraints, right? If your job's not going well, it easily means you lost your job or you didn't get promoted or you just, even if you're unhappy and miserable in a really good paying job, you're still unhappy and miserable and, and you compromise a lot of who you are. And it affects, of course, you go home and it affects it. Interestingly, I just finished a mentoring session with, with somebody in England and part of the growth mentor platform that I'm on. And he's 26 years old. And he said, I need, please help me. I, I'm young and I need to have uh, uncomfortable conversations with people that work for me. But I'm a kind person and I don't want him to take advantage of me and I don't know how to do it. Hmm. And, and so we did a quick role playing and I said, so, so tell me about somebody you need to have a conversation. Well, there's somebody that works in my team and they do social media content production and the person publishes content with spelling mistakes and the client of the agency obviously noticing and it's not a good thing right and I said so how do we have this concept well let's have the conversation and I said you talk to me I'm the guy you're the manager we couldn't do it and I said okay let's reverse roles and we did a quick simulation on how to have this uncomfortable conversation but at the end I said to them listen if you're a kind person as a manager don't change you don't have to be an asshole like yeah. Steve Jobs to create a good company. Steve Jobs was a real jerk, but everybody looks at him and said, wow, you know, it was Steve Jobs. 
Um, you don't have to be that to create success. Just stay who you are. You just have to have a conversation between one human being to another. But the one question I, I told them to ask, if it's a recurring problem, which I know you like, is, look, off the record, Tess, is there anything going on in your personal life that's affecting your ability to come to work every day and do the best work you can, okay? Because if there is, I'd like to know, and if there's a way for me to help you, I would help you. But you understand you cannot bring these kind of problems into work, okay? Because mm -hmm. it affects you and affects people around you. So, so that's the... I think that's the human aspect of it's it's human resources. Yep. And I think one of the challenges that I've always seen with human resources, particularly the people that sit in those positions, is humans are often treated as a commodity as opposed to the first part of the HR, which is the human. And your job as a human resource manager, even if you hire and you fire and you do training, all that stuff, it's not just a, a, it's not routine. It's not about shuffling things around the chessboard. These are living, breathing human people, human beings yes, 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 who yes. are as, just like you, right? So, so to me, the, the, the number one lesson about leadership is humility for you to recognize that I don't care what your title is you're still a human being. And somebody that I follow and admire, his name is Rich Litvin. He's a high, high end coach. He always says something that's so true. He said, if you're the smartest guy in the room, Find the you're, in the you're in the wrong room. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that's the humility piece that, that gets there. So um, tell me about, so, so you did this stuff, but at the same time, you're also, a dabbling in entrepreneurship and investing in companies and getting involved. So the first company I saw was Mums, M U M S. Tell me about yes. Mums. Tell me about Mums. So Mums is a company based in Uganda. They're into production, uh, skincare and hair care, basically, uh, uh, primarily. Then we extended into cleaning products during COVID. So sanitizers and all other disinfectants but mom's products is um in existence because it gives back to society and that is why i'm part of it i i love um helping the less privileged that is a topic that that really makes me emotional but um so mom's products we we do production for skincare hair care and cleaning products so we get the raw materials from Turkey and then do the production in Uganda. And then we do white labeling as well. Okay. So yeah. you didn't so you didn't develop those products. They are you're making them for other companies. Yes. Okay. And so what is the piece of of giving back to it to Uganda? What is where's the connection here? So the people that do the production. Uh, so are you are you doing this because it gives it supp it supplies work for people in Uganda and that's your way of of giving back? No, um, mom's mom's products. We mainly hire people that um, have are well educated but have failed to find jobs. Okay. But have the okay. skills. Yes. And people that have failed to find jobs, like you've been you 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 graduated three years ago and you. There is proof that you've been trying to find jobs and you can't find jobs. So those are the kind of people we're focusing on mm -hmm. because there are so many well-educated and employed people in Uganda. Hmm. So how how big is or how small is Uganda in terms of population? 45 million people. Oh, wow. So that's not small at all. And, uh, lot. Yeah, and 70% uh, of them are below the age of 40. And what's the... Is it what's the number one income producing jobs for people in Uganda? Is it a service economy? It's not. It's not manufacturing, right? No, it's not. It's not. It's not manufacturing because manufacturing is still small scale. It's service services. Okay. Um, are there natural resources in Uganda that that 
uh, are unique to the country that you can harvest and and produce and and create income or is it uh, uh or I, I can't think of tourism in Uganda because I haven't seen in the US I haven't seen organized tours to Uganda but is that is tourism a big deal or it is it is it is a big deal it, it is a big deal in Uganda there's tourism there's farming agriculture so mm -hmm. those are the biggest sources of income for Ugandans okay yeah interest very interesting so um let's go to your next company where you are an investor that got me super excited uh called Neostasi is that pronouncing it right yeah so Neostasi, talk about yeah. talk about Neostasi so where do I start <laughs> that one has a lot sorry so in um a few years ago in 2021 I had a dream. So in this dream, someone was handing over to me so many dirty kids and I was rejecting them because they were dirty. But then the person insisted. So I said, okay, because of because there were other people around me and I didn't want to look like I'm a mean person. So I was like, okay, let me take these kids. And then later on, after, after a few days, I spoke to my mom and I told her about the dream. And she told me, you know, I, I, I've wanted to tell you about a project that I want to get involved in supporting people, um, the less advantaged. Then um, I think it was like the third week, I get another dream. The same person who gave me kids told me, I've been told to give you that piece of land. It was a very big, junk, a very big piece of land. And it had it was like a forest. So I said, that is too much for me. I don't need it. <laughs> then the person said, the kids I gave you will need that. So getting out of my dream, I was like, what am I going to do? Like, what do I have to do? And as, as clearly as I'm speaking to you right now, I had someone say, I was alone in the bedroom, but somebody told me that you are a mother to those kids. Start supporting them. The same way I've said it. And I was like, who is here with me? Because it was just me in the bedroom. So then I'm like, what should I, what should I do? Moms was there, but I didn't want to involve, you know, moms in, into this. This sounded, this felt more like it was personal, you know, to me. So, so um, because I know production for skincare and hair care, I've, I've done that myself. So it's like, all right, let me start doing something. And then I look for kids to help, like kids that don't have school fees. So I started, just how I started in, in Nelstasi. Then my mom passed. The, actually, the day was supposed to launch the company because I wanted to launch it and give it to her to run it. It's the same day she died. Mm. Now, when she died, I was like, okay, I think this is, this is a bad idea. I'm not supposed to be doing this because how can you die on the day they're launching your business? <laughs> so I put it on hold for some time. And then again in a dream, the same person who gave me kids last time came back and this, this time she was sad. So she said, I gave you kids that you can't take care of. I can tell you that I got out of that dream scared that I had disappointed. I, you know that there was that fear of like you've disappointed somebody. It's, it's like you, you are capable of doing something but you've not done it deliberately. Then I was like, okay, now I have to get back to the idea of educating these kids. Then I sat down and did some exercises. And then I came down to a conclusion that I'm going to specifically help kids that are orphans. Then I spoke to my, uh, I spoke to my spiritual father and uh, because they were getting kids off the streets every Sunday. And he used to tell, he used to say that, uh, if you have clothes, if you have food, bring for these kids. And if you can take any, any of them to school, we'll be glad because they are getting them off the street. So I told him, I want to focus on the orphans. And the reason is, you see, everybody says there is light at the end of the tunnel. But when you look at these kids, <laughs> there is no light at the end of the tunnel. Both the parents are dead. And 
in my experience, the times I, I, I was in Uganda, I realized that every child whose parents died either ended up in a very bad school or abandoned because there was nobody to extend that love like the parents did. So I was like, no, these are the, this is the category of kids that don't have light at the end of the tunnel. That is why I took them up and there's like every profit I'll make out of neostasy, I will educate these orphans. And I, I have kids, 60 kids between the age of eight and 15. And now for me, it is not just about educating them. Remember in moms, we are fighting so hard to see that we end the unemployment of the well-educated. So for me, I, I, um, my goal is to make sure that when they graduate, they are creating jobs. So what I do is every holiday, I'm sitting with them on Zoom calls to coach them so that they can make the right career decisions. So, so tell me again, so Neostasi, but what does the company do? Is it, is it the revenue generator allows you to take care of the orphans? Yes. And what, so what is the revenue? What, what is actually, it's skincare again? Yeah, it's skincare, hair care, weight loss, and intimacy care. So skincare, hair care, I make the products here in Finland. And then I outsource some for intimacy care and weight loss. And that's, and that's outsourced to, to where, to Uganda, to Neostasi? I sell, I sell across, so I have an agent in Uganda and have an agent in uh, UAE, in Dubai. Mm. So we, do, we, we, we mainly sell through the website. Okay, so Neostasi is, is just a vehicle for you to generate revenue that you then use to take care of the orphans. Yes. Okay, I get it. And so you're like the... Uh, uh, you know Oprah Winfrey, right? You've heard of Oprah of in the US. <laughs> Who didn't hear from Oprah? So you're like the you're like the mini version of Oprah without all that money. That's be, being able to make a difference in the lives of uh, of orphan in in your home country, which is amazing. So, um, you know, one of the challenges that that whenever I come across causes for me personally, that's just my own perspective. Um, mm -hmm is how do you know that the money that's being generated is actually being used for the purpose that it was designated for, right? So when I when I give $100 to a charity in the US, um, I won't give it to a charity unless I feel 100% that they're using every cent of the $100 to support the cause that I believe in, right? Because there is a lot of them that will use $80 out of 100 to pay salaries to stupid executives and $20 are left to actually do that stuff. So you're in Finland. The orphans are in Uganda. Do you have somebody in Uganda that is taking care of logistics and actually the hands-on of doing this for you? Yes, I have a team in Uganda that that handles everything. So this is this is what happens. All the 60 children, not all of them have homes. <clears throat> so some of them stay in schools, even during holiday. So we just have to pay extra fees and they stay in schools and for now, because we just started. And then we have some that we phone homes for, and then we take care of those homes as well. So the team in Uganda is responsible for the fees. They pay the school fees. They go to school and pay, actually pay the school fees there. They make sure the kids have everything um, because, well, you know, in Finland, bookkeeping taxes are really important. Mm -hmm. If if A and B don't connect, they, you won't proceed to the next level, right? So, and everything is done here. So when, if, if, if there are questions here, I have to ask questions to people in Dubai and people in Uganda. So everything has to be aligned. Um, we've grown, we've grown so fast. If the money was going elsewhere, and I'm not paying anybody that I'm working with, I'm not paying, I'm not paying them. I get the money from Cat Consult, I invest it in Nostasy, and nobody else is getting anything from Nostasy other than the children. Mm. That's a, that's incredible. 
Uh, this is worth you being on a podcast to to as an example and role model for people who are, uh, you know, always giving back and and thinking about the the the, the underprivileged, the less privileged people uh, in the universe. Um, so very very inspiring, Tess. So let's talk about what you what your day job is. <laughs> Yes, my day job is uh, career coaching. Right, so, and you have you have an impressive following on LinkedIn. Uh, I think I think it was like forty thousand, whatever, fifty thousand people follow you. Um, fifty thousand something. I don't know. I don't yeah. remember. So, so, you know, it's it's one of these professions that, you know, I'm, I'll talk about the U.S. market. Yeah. That I could be in the middle of Fifth Avenue, New York City, and take a stick and just start banging it, turn around and bang it, and I'm likely to, to hit a couple of coaches, and yes. a few of them will probably be career coaches. And I'm a business coach, so maybe I hit myself too. But the problem with coaching, it's a brilliant concept, but the problem with it is that way too many people who are not qualified to coach get into that business and wind up ruining for those of us who are committed professionals who know what they're doing right yeah and you pick something i think there's an international flair to what you do because you help people find jobs in other countries right yes which is which is even more challenging but yeah. we live in a post-COVID world that's mostly digital and people think that because you can you can post your job on every job board that's out there mm -hmm. that you'll get a job and in reality is maybe one percent of them do probably less mm -hmm. so you pick something that's on one hand very challenging uh, uh on the other um it's tough to find, I mean, I mean, I don't know about the rest of Europe, but the U.S., despite all this talk about recession and all the other nonsense, we, the employment is a full employment. It's, it's impossible to find people. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, some people blame COVID for it, but I don't, not sure that's the real answer. Mm -hmm. um, how do you differentiate what you do from everybody and their cousin three times removed who is a coach of something? I'll, I'll just say it this way. Um, I help people get hired in less than 90 days. If you know five coaches, how many have been able to help more than 5,000 people to get hired in less than 90 days? Results don't lie. I can start, I can sit here and tell you, oh, I'm the best, I can do this and that and the other, but what are the results? I started full-time coaching in February, 2020. And today I have 5,860 something uh, clients that have gotten hired in less than 90 days. Okay, so I'm a business coach, marketing specialist, but business coach. How does a one woman super impressive one woman show able to in a span of two years February 2020 so three years get that many clients how do you how are you able to handle all that work that's question number one question number two you can you can get to it any way you want is getting to 50,000 followers on LinkedIn is incredible how'd you do that um, the first question, <laughs> I believe in this statement, do what you do best, outsource the rest. Mm -hmm. If you think you're going to do everything, then you're not. So I focus on what I do best and find other coaches who do what I don't really want to do. And I'll partner with them and we work together. I don't believe in competition. I believe in collaboration. Mm -hmm. So there is a company I, I helped grow. It's called Malik. 
it's a platform that has career coaches. I trained, I oriented and onboarded all of these coaches and made sure they come up as good career coaches. Even, even if I'm also doing the same. Mm -hmm. So all of these people around me, if I have something that I cannot take, take on, I have somebody else to do it. So there is a community. I built the community. I, I, you know, building relationships is very important. I just wrote an, um, a post today about networking and building relationships. And I, this is not emphasized enough. The people you bring close to you determine where you're going to be tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So for me, that has helped me a lot. So, so you're using leverage to... So I guess the my other question is, how do people find you, right? If you if you have five thousand clients, successful clients in three years, um, I'm assuming, just math, that those are the five thousand that converted the clients, but there were other people that interacted with you and said, okay, that's now for me, right? So it's still work. How do you prom How do people find you? How do you promote yourself? I, I use organic reach, one, but then two, 80% of my clients are referrals. Right. So if you go back to day number one, when you started this, February 2020, yeah. zero, zero referral clients at that point, right? You just started. Yeah. How I, you... I, I, I wrote a post on LinkedIn because you have to put yourself out there. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak, no one is going to know what you know. So I put a post out there. I said, I will help you get hired if you're looking for a job. So there was a, there was a lady who came to me and she was like, I've been looking for a job. Uh, can you help me? I'm like, yeah, why not? That was my first client who I charged 55 euros. <laughs> now, let me tell you why I charged that person 55 euros. So this is what I didn't talk about. Um, when I moved here, it was November 2019. To Finland and then 2020 COVID hit so there was a history of domestic violence in my relationship in my marriage so when COVID hit so there was a lot of drinking every day he was drinking and working at the same time so domestic violence levels went up so we had to leave all right mm -hmm. me and, and the kids had to leave so <clears throat> That is when I started because new I'm, I'm, I've just moved to the country, I have no source of income, I don't know the language, but I have to go to the next to the next level in my life. That is when I started full time coaching, and my first client paid fifty five euros that I desperately needed, <laughs> and in two weeks she got a job. She had been looking for a job for two years. In two weeks, she got a job. She brought me her cousin, who I charged 150 euros. I wrote her CV. In three days, she had four interviews. <laughs> and then she got a job. I think the fourth week, she got a job. She got me two other people, who I charged 500 each. <laughs> so you see, that is how I, I started to, you know, to grow. <clears throat> and... Everybody I was working with was coming and were getting a job. And then, of course, some would just come for CV writing and then others for LinkedIn profile optimization. Then some for just consultancy <clears throat> because I've had a lot of clients. But the ones that I've worked with on packaging, because I do provide independent services, but also job search secrets, which is a package. Mm -hmm. So I sit with you. We do skills mapping because it's not... <clears throat> It's a waste of time for us to start working on your job search when you've not done skills mapping. Many people, unfortunately, get into the job search, still focusing on the role they were doing, which they don't want to do. So their resume is full of the skills that they were doing the previous role, which they don't want. <clears throat> so we first work on the skills mapping, then know what exactly you want to do, then write your resume, your LinkedIn profile, and then uh, dive into the job site strategies that are going to help you based on your skills, your profile, and the the country you're targeting. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, I I was a graduate marketing professor for six years in New York City, and 
part of the fun thing for me was to mentor my MBA students who were all working executives. Some of them were not all managerial. Um, and so I had like a side gig of, of teaching them a, a, a workshop that I called self-marketing, where I said, look, you're in the MBA track and you you learning about marketing. You are just like a product or service that we market outside. You just have to look at yourself as um, as, as such and find ways to distinguish and differentiate yourself, especially when you are internally, even if you don't leave your job, even if you work within a company, you still want to build a way to distinguish yourself and differentiate yourself from other people in a company. If you want to get noticed and maybe somebody's going to say, well, I have, we have a promotional advance opportunity, who are we going to pick? Well, they're going to pick the person that's making a difference, that that is different. So internally, it's fine. But when you look for a job, you'll market yourself just like anybody markets toilet paper or Uber or whatever it is. It doesn't make yeah. it. The, the principles are pretty much the same, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like like that's that's what you focus on. But the the job search, are you doing the job search for them or you prepare them and then they go out and find? Uh, I prepare them. <clears throat> okay, now for CAT Consult, which is the coaching and HR consultants mm -hmm. and all that, the license, we just we just did it in Dubai. So I have a team in Dubai. <laughs> you know, when I tell people what I do, they're like, how do you, how do you manage all this? So I have 20 employees in Dubai. Who do career <laughs> coaching. Yeah, so I do uh, HR consultancy. They, we manage HR um, operations for companies. Okay. So yes. what they do is we audit the company. We see what where they are at as compared to where they want to go. And then I have a team that will visit maybe once or twice, depending on the contract, once or twice a week <clears throat> to help with the HR services operations for that company. So I have a team of, of 20 people, but then some are HR, then some are coaching and then, you know, yeah. It's, it's brilliant. You're, you're able, you're taking yourself and you're leveraging yourself uh in different areas which answers my question how were you able to get that many clients as a as a one woman operation and the answer is you leverage yourself and you create partnerships and you collaborate um and the answer to how do i get to fifty thousand linkedin followers is organically by posting content that people are interested in that's not self-promoting that's helpful and educational yes, yes. and practical and that's really from some of the people that I know that have 20 to 30 to 40 to 50,000 followers, which look, all of us would give our right hand to get that kind of followers. Mm -hmm. But what the end, the, at the end of the day, it's not really a secret. It's just you have to commit to communicating about things that you're happy to share willingly without playing games of secrets. You know, a, a lot of people, in, in this space will give you just a little bit of a taste of what they know that tease you. But if you want more, then you can hire me or take my course online for $10,000 or whatever. Um, I don't know if I'm, if maybe I'm making this stuff up, but did, are you guaranteeing that people will get a job in 90 days? Yes. If you do what I tell you to do, you're going to get it. And how do you know that I did what you told me to do? I have I have a system that will hold you accountable for whatever it is because <clears throat> coaching is about you give them tasks then you give them material then you give them tools and all that so if someone is not doing their job then first of all every client that I have and this is a tip anybody that is listening is planning to get a job can use you should have an excel sheet how many come how many people have you contacted what is the status so what is what is your project management tool? Yeah. <laughs> it's more like a project management tool. You're looking for a job. How are you tracking it? Mm -hmm. It is beyond just writing in your journal, I contacted this person. There has to be something that is organized that you look at and you say, I've contacted these many people this week and this is the feedback. I'm not contacting this person again. By just looking at that Excel sheet, so what, what I what I tell my mentees uh, is to kind of do, do suggest what you did, except I tell them, 
get a simple CRM platform, nothing complicated, and use the CRM to manage your job search. Mm -hmm. uh, Excel spreadsheets is a good thing, but it's tough to create reminders and follow-ups. And then when there are, if they're at, in the rare occasion, they get an email response from someone, which we know that's not difficult, that's not easy, then everything is self-contained within the CRM, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the, the customer relationship management, which you can use for yourself. And yes. the history of who you contacted is there. If there's replies, they're in the history. You can create follow-up tasks. You can create all the other things. Um, so what happens if I did everything you told me to do and in 90 days, I still didn't get a job? We haven't had even one case like that. Okay. And look, I if love you're the, the first, then we have, I don't, I don't even see it being possible. Why? <clears throat> we sit down every two weeks. I sit down with my clients every two weeks. What has worked, what has not worked. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I don't repeat myself. <laughs> I don't repeat myself. <laughs> and my clients know it. You're looking for a job. I'm going to give you the tools that you need. And that's it. I, I'm not going to run after you. Mm -hmm. And your contract says that. I'm going to give you whatever you need. Do whatever you're supposed to do. So we sit down and we go through what has worked, what has not worked. All right, let's tweak this. Let's do it this way. And if I see that a person is not getting anything within 40 days, most times I get into, I put on their shoes. So I try to apply like two, two places and see if I'm going to get the same results as they're getting. Hmm. Well, so there well, is no way somebody can fail. There is no way. Unless they're lazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, and again, from my perspective, the fact that you are academically trained in psychology and you're dealing with humans, uh, perhaps it helps you because um, human beings are irrational. They're lazy. They expect things to happen. Uh, most people don't right. want to do the They don't want to do the work. They, yep. okay, I hired you as a coach. You don't, but, but so, okay, nothing's happening. Well, I'm giving you the tools. I'm giving you the keys to the car, but you're gonna have to drive it. And if you exactly. drive it, and you, if you drive it, you better have a plan of where you want to go. And then, with my tools, my navigational tools, you're gonna get there. But if you choose I to have, ignore, I have really fun exercises that we do. So in most cases, the person is motivated to go and do the work themselves. So then, by the second week, <laughs> they haven't realized time has gone. They're like, "Oh, it's already two weeks." I've done this and this, and then I give you another exercise. We do it, and you're still motivated. Before you know, you're hired. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, I guess uh, first of all, so so thank you for being so open about your personal life, and and sharing what happened during COVID. Uh, are things better now? I mean, you're smiling, you're happy, you you you're glowing. Is life good? I mean, he's. I'm always the, smiling. <laughs> where, where, where's the Nokia guy? Is he around or he's done? <laughs> he's somewhere. Um, I don't know where he is right now, but uh, he is somewhere still in Oulu. And um, I don't know. Um, I've not spoken to him in two weeks. <laughs> okay. We That's have that right. relationship because we have children together. Yes. Yeah. So, and. He's respected as the father of the children and the children respect him as well. That's all that is important. He's healthy, everything else. Look, yeah. your, your mission in life is to, to take care of orphan children in Uganda. And um, uh, look, I'm, I, I'm a product of, the, not a product of divorce. I've, I've gone through the process. Um, it's absolutely brutal on the children. And so yes, we yes. have we have to think of kids of divorce as the orphans in our own life because, you know, I, I can't relate to it because I came from a happy home, right? And that's a the, the one thing I shared with my own kids. And I said, look, I don't know how you feel, right? Everybody else in the U.S. has, has come from, not everybody. There's so many people that come from divorced families. Mm -hmm. And so... They live through it and you hope that they don't repeat it or put their kids through it, but but they do. I was a disadvantage because I didn't know 
mm-hmm. what my kids were feeling. Um, and uh, it, I felt their pain to this day. Um, mm-hmm. But we we have to we have to take a step back and say, listen, there are the there are our kids, even mm-hmm. though we're separated. But we don't realize that. Yeah, even though they mostly stay with the mom, whatever you have shared custody, which I had, whatever. But you still, you, you, they're still alone. They're orphaned. They're orphaned to some degree because the home that they knew, the yeah, nucleus yeah. of a family that they knew, is not yeah. there anymore. And we have to pay attention to it. Um, yeah. So, um, for my kids, was it was a bit different, I think. Um, for at least for the first year, because for us it was domestic violence, mm-hmm. and they were traumatized. They would, <laughs> I remember, you know, I don't know. It's just in me to laugh, so don't think that I'm, you know. Uh, it's really funny. Sometimes I even laugh at myself. So we, they would wake up when we had just left his home. They would wake up and scream because in Finnish, "isi" is daddy. So we'd wake up and say, oh, is he wants to kill me? Is he wants to kill me? I'm like, no, 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 he's not here. He's not here. It's, it's, it's okay. You're safe here. So it went on for a while. And so they didn't have that so much attachment. First of all, um, just to take you back a little bit, before he moved to Finland, when he was transferred to Finland, I stayed in Dubai for one year. I was scared. Mm. And I told him, you know, you wanted to kill me in Dubai where I feel safe. How about in Finland when I don't speak where I don't speak the language? How how can I come there? So I stayed there for a year. Actually, it was a year and a half. But because by law, if you're not living together for two years, then you are automatically divorced. So I was like, okay, I think it's time for. I've, I've really procrastinated a little bit. Let me just go and see what happens. And it it really happened. What I was really fearful of, like Job said the thing I feared most has come to to pass. So immediately we got here, COVID, and then the exact thing I was scared of happened. But I'm glad that it it did happen at that time when they are still that young, because one is 10 and the other is now eight. They have outgrown the pain. Although they do feel, they do miss their father from time to time, you know? Of course, like, oh, I miss AC and, and all that. But I'm glad that they don't remember most of the, the violence mm. because they were still young. And I'm, I'm glad that they don't have to, you know, carry that with them forever. Because sometimes when you separate as parents and then they feel there is a lack, probably they don't have, they don't get what they want or what they need, then they start to miss the other person who was providing. Now, for me, that is the first thing I worked on. I said, I'm not going to learn Finnish. I'm going to make sure that I first get financially stable, that once they ask for something, I can provide it. So that they don't look back and say, okay, he used to give us this and she cannot. So once the people I came with to, to, to Finland were landing finished, I was busy looking for money. <laughs> but wait, but and, they but they speak Finnish, right? Because they go to school and they're there, right? But the kids, the kids right now speak Finnish. They are almost fluent. Uh, I speak a little bit. I can just go, you know, I can just mm-hmm. have a, a basic conversation. I understand. I cannot get lost. I cannot stay hungry in case I was stranded. I can, I can find my way. I can ask for help. So what else? I can talk about my, I can introduce myself and that's it. So Tess, you told me before you had the voices. They revealed themselves to you and told you, you're going to get the land and you're going to get the kids. Uh, And and we're just about an hour of me hanging out with you. And uh, really, I I mean it, that the visions that I have in front of me is you on a TED stage. I don't know why, but I, I see you like on a TED stage talking. Hopefully, I think, look, you, you, you are incredibly impressive, uh, so genuine. Um, a lot of people in your situation would have fallen into the victimized routine and 
you just just the opposite, right? Uh, no, I, whatever the situation is, I'm getting out of it. I'm I'm going to be independent. I'm going to take care of my kids, take care of my career, and you help other people take care of their careers. So it's just like a, a perfect cycle of what maybe what you meant to do, meant to be. So now a couple quick questions, which I call the rapid fire questions. I didn't tell you about those, but here you go. Are you ready? Um, <laughs> these are one word answers. We don't have to talk about them. One person that most influenced you the most. Life or business? In my life? Yeah. My mom. Okay. My late mom, yeah. Um, best advice you've ever received? Don't mind about what people think about you. It's their thoughts, not yours. Perfect. So the next one, I, I'm going to use the same thing. If you had a billboard in Times Square in New York, you know, that stuff with the, <laughs> what would you put on it? I'm guessing you exactly what you just told me. So no, I'll, I'll, I'll say impacting lives, not impressing them. <laughs> okay, great. Um, one one book that maybe changed your life? The, eh, there's so many, but um, the very first one that, truly, truly changed me was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Okay. I think I saw it in one of your, either the posts or or something that I saw that I, I think I saw the book there. So I'm not surprised. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay. So last question. It's kind of silly. What, what song would you admit to singing in the shower? <laughs> um... <laughs> There's this song, I don't, I don't know the title, but I think it's Yet Not I, but Christ in You. All right, so that's not like a famous boy band or something. It's... No, 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 no. That, that's a song I sing everywhere in the shower, in the car, in anywhere, any day, every day. All right, so you send me a link to that song because I'm curious. Uh, what, yeah, what it's, about. It's, a, so... it's a gospel. It's a, it's, it's a, a gospel. It's a, it's a gospel song, yeah. Interesting. So we have, I'm going to add with some weird tidbit about shared history that we have that you don't even know, but I'm rich. I'm from Israel and the, you know, the, w when Jews were spread all over the world, way before Israel became a country in 1948, you know, they were persec persecuted everywhere. And then you had the world war and the Holocaust of what we went through. Um, and there was some discussion among famous people. One guy's name was Herzl. Uh, where are we going to go settle? The Jews need a place. They need a place to go where they can be safe instead of being spread all over the world and always being persecuted. And so one option was go to Israel, the Holy Land, which is, you know, where the Bible is from. That's the natural place. But do you know what the second choice was? No. Uganda. Really? Yeah. What and did they choose? They chose Uganda? <laughs> no, no. If they chose Uganda, I wouldn't look like this, right? <laughs> but uh, I know. No. I just wanted to make fun of yeah. that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why. I'm. You know, it's it's been a while since since I studied it, but I'm gonna go back and find out. But Uganda was one of the places that they considered. Um to go and settle Jews. And, and it could have been Uganda, the all these, the Jews were in Israelis. Well, they're not Israelis, but I, I don't remember why they picked that, but there was a reason why they picked it. No, I'm, I'm interested. I'm interested in knowing more about and, it. And, and, and the last <laughs> interesting piece, which is not Uganda, how far is Ethiopia from you? Ethiopia? It's not far from Uganda? No, it's not yeah, far. Not far. So it's interesting because in, in, in our heritage and culture, you always go back and say, so where were the original Hebrews, right? The mm -hmm. original tribe of Hebrews that came from Egypt and wandered the world. And for many people, they believe that the original Hebrews are Ethiopians. And there's there was a very big population in Ethiopia who are Jews, people that believe in the Old Testament, you know, the old God, the, the, the different God. Um, and when they were started to be persecuted in Ethiopia, there was a, a huge operation that Israel mounted to go rescue the Ethiopians and bring them to Israel. Uh, 
I don't remember what the number was, but a lot of them. And so there are a lot of Ethiopian Jews living in Israel who look like you. They're Ethiopians. They don't look like me. And they are incredible people. Absolutely incredible. My, my parents had a place where a lot of the Ethiopians were settled. They were sweet, amazing people. And then they go serve in the army and they have these amazing skills of they're great they're absolutely great so anyway that's it that's my that's that's all i know i shared with you a few things that's it that's, um that's interesting so Tess, you're amazing inspiring yeah. thank you for for spending the hour with me um if you want to find Tess, just type test it's the only test in linkedin that has fifty thousand <laughs> followers <laughs> But it's Tess Newman. I'll put the link into, into the show notes. Um, I have about three or four weeks of podcast to release, but I'm thinking I'm this is just so inspirational to me. I'm gonna fast track you to the to the front in the next week or so. It still needs to get to get the auditing on the other stuff, editing, but but it's fine. So um thank you. You're amazing. You're thank you so much for this honor. Uh, I'm 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 humbled, thank you. Um, it's always great to share your story. Uh, mm -hmm. Probably there is somebody who was about to give up and then they're like, okay, you see, there is this saying that if we all got our problems and put them on the table, everybody, after looking at everybody else's problems, they would grab their own and take them back. So <laughs> sometimes we think, <laughs> sometimes we think, we are going through the worst in life. But even though uh, my greatest book, which is the Bible, says that um, there is nothing you're going through that no one else has not gone through. Everything. Mm -hmm. There is nothing new under the sun, right? So it means that somebody has gone through what you're going through, probably even at a deeper degree. Um, so maybe if someone listens to my story, they can be like, mm, I'm, not, I'm not so bad after all. I can also make it. <laughs> and and you know what? It's it's interesting. I'm gonna I don't have to look to the side. I was just about to record uh a new introduction to my podcast. Uh I just created new music for it. And here's this is what it says at the end. I'm reading for you because it's I'm not making the stuff up. Just imagine one shared nugget of wisdom or experience can make a big difference in your business or your life. Um, so this is this is why I do this. I don't do this to promote anything I do. I don't self-promote. I don't allow my guests to promote themselves. It's really about having conversations like you and I had about somebody that probably 100% of my audience never heard of you before, right? Uh, yeah. And now they get to listen to somebody's story and there were so many things that you said that, that you can just to pick one and just spend some time thinking about it, whether it's career, whether it's your personal development, whether it's your marriage, whether it's problems in your marriage, uh, taking care of underprivileged. There's so much stuff that you shared, um, which is what, which is why I do this. Because and and I don't invite famous people to the podcast. Most of them will reject me anyway. Uh, and and it's working because people are now reaching out to me and asking to be guests. So I know, I know people are talking about it for the right reason. But sometimes somebody will come in and say, "How many followers do you have? How many?" And I said, and I said, "Why do you care? Mm -hmm. Okay, why do you care? If one follower, one listener of mine, can pick one thing that you said that's going to make a difference in their life, what do you care if I have ten, five, or thousand? And I don't even know how many people follow me." I don't mm -hmm. care. I mean, I do care I, in terms of the commercial aspect of it. So part of the podcasting BS, if mm -hmm. you look at the top performing podcasts, is the, the hosts will always bring a guest that has massive amount of followers. Yeah. Right. So if I have 50,000 and you have 50,000 combined, we expose our, each other to a group of people that probably never heard of it before. And then you can go sell stuff to them. Right books yes. and high high end coaching and courses and whatever right um not my thing i do this for you when someone like you as a guest just energizes me to keep doing this because to me this was worth everything i mean i spend 
an hour and a half to two hours studying my guests before they show up so I can actually ask a few intelligent questions. And the rest comes from our conversation. You'll say something and I'll stop and I'll say, wait, let's talk about that. Um, yeah. It's a commitment, but this is the piece that you just, just remind me why I do this. Thank you. That's, that, that's so kind of you. And you're doing an amazing job. I've always told people that even if you save one life a day, even if it's a year, that is one generation you have saved. Mm -hmm. Because there are so many people that have a lot of knowledge, but they're using it to destroy others. But if you're saving somebody, even if it's just one person, when I put my posts out there, you see, I share details of how to look for a job. If you, if you look at my posts, I'm explaining, you do this and this and this mm -hmm. and this. But still people come to me and they still pay 6000 and they get the job. But there are also those that have been following me for years. They've never gotten a job. There are those that have been following me for months and they've gotten a job through my posts. Look, I'm not I'm not going to diminish the the challenges of living in in the 21st century and the pressures that we all go under, uh, right? Uh, but the one thing that stops everyone from I think mm -hmm. from doing better is that that what's in it for me, stupid mm -hmm. egotistical kind of, yeah. selfish thing that you the know entitlement. You know that why? You know what's in it for me? What? Why am I sharing all that? But. But when you look at and and there are some people in my in my world of followers and people that I follow um, who have very impressive LinkedIn followers like you and they do exactly what you did. And if you ask them how did you do it, that's exactly how they did it. They share what they know, not because they wanted to get clients, because they wanted to share. So if you're kind, th there's a guy that I trained on his system years ago called Zig Ziglar. And he said something really profound, but it's simple. And his, his quote was, you can get everything in life you want mm. if you help enough other people get what they want, right? The more you give is the more you get. Simple stuff. There's variations of this all over the place, but I, you know, it's, it's pretty rare to come across people that actually do it and believe in it because mm. everything is about a, you know, quid pro quo. You do this for me, I do this for you. And mm. people people get on my podcast or I, people reach out and ask me for help. And then they say, oh, what can I do for you, Zach? I said, nothing. Just be my friend. No, but you helped me so much. I said, I'm okay. Okay? Exactly. Just, be my, yeah. just be my friend. Maybe one day I'm going to ask you to do something for me because I need help, something you know. But this is not what I do it for. Right? Yes. It's, just, it's yes, fine. Yes. So, um, listen, I had I had the pleasure of being in Finland on business a few more than a few times, uh, uh, it was really interesting country. Which Very city? Ah, oh, Helsinki. Turku. Turku. Mm -hmm. Turku. Yes, and yeah. um, I was in the medical industry, and I forgot the name of the company. Um, but the the interesting part was that I just got a brand new mobile phone in New York, and. I was so excited and I got on a flight and I flew to Finland and I remember standing in one of the, one of the beautiful square place at nine 30 in the evening in the summer. So it was still light. Right. Yeah. And I'm calling my wife on a mobile and she said, where are you? And I said, I'm in Finland. It can't be. It sounds so good. You just like, no, you're right. You're next door. And I said, no, no, I'm in Finland. I'm telling you, I'm standing here. The reason I tell you the story is that I came back home like a week later and I tried to make a phone a phone call out of this mobile phone when I was two blocks away and I had no cell signal. And the signal was horrible. And I called the company and I said, and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't tell you in your town there's a bad sig signal, it won't work. And I said, but you sold me the damn phone. And I just, yeah. wasn't, I was in Finland. It was beautiful. I had five bars. I'm back home and I got zero bars. The only place I can actually talk to people is go to the outside my house. There's an area where I throw the garbage. Mm -hmm. That seems to be the only place I can talk to people. And it's not comfortable to smell the garbage. So, I know. 
So anyway, that's like interesting. I get more stories for you on Finland, but it's okay. Tess, you're amazing. Thank you. Let's stay in touch. Um, yes, let's stay in touch. And I'll let you know when this goes live. All right. Thank you All so right. much. Thanks. And thank you so care. much. Bye. Bye.